Have you seen any dodgy behavior? Have you seen them try to suppress health warnings around alcohol? Does that feel like that you're taking on the Goliath of the liquor industry in the sense that I would imagine that Fours, for example, or any of these big companies would not want to welcome you with open open arms and say, yeah, come in here and possibly take revenue away from what we're doing. So have you bumped up against that? Like, has there been any of the big brands that have proactively or intentionally tried to not get you into either stadiums or have somehow tried to sabotage your your efforts? I think more than anything, it's been a bit of their ignorance on the importance of the category, right? They could really own some of those because now they have their own line extensions, but they haven't put their thought and effort into some of them. And so now the venues themselves are actually who's making this call, who's like, we want to have more inclusive options. And so we're going to work with partners that are ready to, you know, really invest into that part and to to talk about non-alcoholic. And I think when it talks, when we like compare the big guys into, you know, some of these smaller brands and Groovy as kind of a bit more of a craft player coming into the space, I think ultimately it comes down to the consumer as well. And I think authenticity is a big factor in how we choose what we consume across all categories right now. And I think a ton of the big brands or even just a lot of the breweries, they're going to come up with this line extension because they see the opportunities. They see the business opportunity in having a non-alcoholic option as a line extension. And at Groovy, it's our bread and butter. It's all that we do. It's the reason why we started, right? Like you said, there's a personal tie into it. And so I think the more that we can actually share that story out, that that resonates because that's where people are coming from and they want a brand that is really focused on that goal and that mission. So I wouldn't say that we've had anyone, you know, necessarily knocking on our doors or trying to bat us away, but I think that the more that we can kind of get our voices out there, that that's going to have a strong impact on, on the category and our brand as a whole. Do you feel like you're competing against the liquor industry Or do you feel when a Heineken comes out with a Heineken Zero, that actually helps Groovy? Do you feel like with increased awareness, and even if Coors came out with the 0% uh, options and Budweiser have a Bud Zero, of course, and, you know, as these big traditional liquor companies start producing their own 0% options, are you in competition with them? That's how you feel? Or do you think that's good for the category and it's good for Groovy? I think I think it's twofold. I think there is a portion where you're on competition with some of the big alcohol brands. And I think that is a larger portion of how we glamorize alcohol as society, right? How when we think about even as our nutritional panels, as I go through packaging, what we need to put on there. And if you look at liquor and alcoholic beer, they don't need to put the calorie amount. They don't need to disclose what's in the product. And even as we talk about some of these things, like, you know, it's come up in Canada, do we put cancer warning labels on alcohol, right? Because ultimately there is now a ton of research around that. And so you have a a huge Goliath of an industry that's going to tear a lot of that down. That's going to cover up a lot of that data that doesn't want to talk about it. But when I talk about, you know, the big brands coming out with a non-alcoholic option and investing their dollars into marketing, I think that, yes, ultimately that is growing the awareness as a whole. You're hitting demographics that wouldn't have thought about drinking less, that wouldn't have transitioned to, you know, a Heineken zero, zero, and you're getting in front of them. And so I think the category is still at a standpoint where, you know, what's that saying? All rising tides, all the rising tides lift all boats, right? And so I think that that's really how I approach the category now, instead of having this negative competition view, it's how can we build it together um, and really bring it to consumers in this positive standpoint. Mm. Yes. Have you noticed big liquor or big alcohol? That's what I like to call them now, big alcohol. It's like big pharma, you know, like it's a way of suggesting the pharmaceutical companies don't have our best interests at heart, that they just (laughs) want to make a bunch of money. The big alcohol, have you seen any dodgy behavior, for lack of a better word? Have you seen them try to suppress health warnings around alcohol the context of the question is, uh, I had a 
um, a wonderful guest on the show a couple of months ago. And I invite you, the listener, to go back and listen to it if you haven't already with Professor Tim Stockwell. And Professor Tim Stockwell is out of the University of Victoria in Canada. And he conducted uh, a study a study on 107 previously published studies on alcohol and its effects, uh, which involved uh, more than 5 million participants. And his study results came out, which suggested that any um, any suggestion in any study that alcohol was good for you in any way was skewed and biased. And yet we see all of these studies that say a glass of wine is good for the heart health and all of this is growing, blah, 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 blah. And more than that, Professor, Professor Stockwell shared with me on that particular episode, actually, I think I, I released or published three episodes uh, with Professor Stockwell. He said that he actually experienced people trying to shut down his research. In fact, he was threatened by a liquor store chain owner because the liquor store chain owner found out that he was doing this study and that the results were going to paint alcohol in a poor light. And this liquor store opener felt like that was going to compromise his ability to generate income, obviously. And then more than that, Professor Stockwell shared that he actually had uh, organizations, you know, like uh, the body, like bodies of liquor companies, again, trying to influence study outcomes suppress anything that would damage alcohol's reputation. That was that was what he shared. So my question to you is, have you experienced anything of that? Have you seen any of that? Have you heard anything like that? Yeah. Um, I don't feel like I have a concrete example and experience per se with that. I do find that, again, you know, so Canada, was it last year, 2022? Right. Yes. That they came up with their new regulations on alcohol consumption. Right. And so it hadn't been updated in like 11 years, 15 years, something along those lines. And so it was still saying that about 11, 15 drinks a week, it was kind of the guidelines. And now they've updated it to saying, you know, one to two a week, and we can't say any amount is is safe for you, right? And so there was this huge shock. And again, with that, what's kind of tied this notion, while it also, you know, many studies showing the impact of cancer, especially also women and breast cancer tied with the consumption of alcohol, do we put these label warnings on alcohol so that people have this awareness? And again, it's going back to like cigarettes, right? And it was mandated that they had to have that education on there. And so I think, you know, I haven't seen what's happening, but I know at the forefront ultimately is these big alcohol companies shutting that down as fast as they can, right? And there's still so many years that were put into these studies of a glass of wine a day is good for you, right? Mm -hmm. And that people still believe and believe. And I was really turned off when I watched, I don't know if you watched a Netflix episode or show like blue zones that was talking about these different areas where people live the longest. And I think it was in Greece that he pointed out like wine and brought that up as one of the five reasons why people are living the longest. And it was like, so many people are going to watch this and take the wrong, you know, story from that because they're going to go, okay, well, I can have my glass of wine and it's actually doing good for me. I'm going to live the longest actually, if I have a glass of wine a day. And I saw that up front at the farmer's market the following week, this lady being like, yeah, I watched that episode. And the lady said it was good to have wine. And now she's buying herself wine. And so I think it's these subtle messages that have been infiltrated so deeply into our belief system that they're really hard to break down. Um, and so I'm, I'm actually sitting on the board of AMBA. I don't know if you're familiar with this, but this is the Adult Non-Alcoholic Beverage Association. And so we formed this together and one of the founding members, we put this together two years ago, we're on our third year now, um, and brought together some of the independent non-alcoholic brands, beer, wine, liquor, um, to really start to build some of those guidelines and regulations around the category. Some of them are so outdated with, you know, the TTB, again, regulating non-alcoholic beer. You can't use words like lager to describe your product, but ultimately that is what our product is. It's been so long associated that a lager is going to have alcohol and 
we're all here to prove you wrong. It doesn't. Um, and so with AMBA, really starting to do a lot more work on the regulatory side, on how we think of the category, how the category gets placed in retail, um, and ultimately providing the education to the consumer as well. Mm. 